everybody, welcome back to the channel. We are back with another episode of Daily Palantir. On today's episode, Sham Sankar, the CTO of Palantir, uh, put out an article today, this morning. And it was a really interesting article. We're going to talk about that article, what it means. I believe if you're a long-term shareholder in Palantir, this article gives you a glimpse into why they had excessive stock-based compensation for a while, how they think about talent and uh, retaining that talent, and also the culture around the company that you are theoretically invested in for a long time. So we're gonna discuss that article. We'll also discuss Databricks CEO who came out and said something very interesting about Snowflake that I think it's important to analyze as we are constantly comparing Palantir and Snowflake. And then I've got some updates on boot camps that are launching all across the world. A lot to get into. Let's get into it. Real quick, before we get started, please subscribe, dailypalantir.substack.com. We are trying to build that entire newsletter. It's a free email newsletter every single day for Palantir. If you are interested at all of getting this video in the written form, please subscribe. It takes two seconds in the description, dailypalantir.substack.com. All right, let's get into the video. Okay, so first thing let's start off with is uh, Sham's new article, which I thought was pretty good in the context of, of what he was trying to say around Pounter's culture. So let me get to the tweet first. I'll pull that up right now. And I'm gonna read through that tweet a little bit and then we'll read a little bit of that article because I thought the article was pretty good. So Sham says, when people ask me, how do you build a high performing engineering team? The answer is, I don't. High performance engineering teams are downstream of culture and a culture reigns supreme if it has internalized the primacy of winning because winning is what matters. J-Rock said it best, win, 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 Fuck everything else, win. It's obvious, but not enough people think this way. Engineers get caught up in how they want the world to work, how they've been thought the world, have the how they've been taught the world should work, but they really understand how the world actually works, and you can't win if you aren't living in reality. I thought this was a, a hell of a quote right there, basically saying, hey, the culture of Pouncher is to win. I mean, it's it's a it's sort of an exciting mantra to to get behind. Uh, it's a natural human tendency to define the problem based on what you can win at, but that is the ultimate corruption. You have to take the red pill and see how far the rabbit hole goes. 18 years in, and I haven't hit the bottom yet. What, is he, what he's implying there is that everyone tends to do what they already are good at, what they've been proven to be good at, but embracing the unknown and trying to do something that's different, whether it's in a job and a you know in a new business that you're starting, whatever it may be. That's where all the beauty of life is. But that's where all the unknown is. That's where all the reward is for taking the risk. But you got to go down that, that rabbit hole to see if you can actually embrace that new form of reality. Roadmaps, planning, communication, release notes, and the process du jour aren't evil. But when process interferes with the primacy of winning, you're doing it wrong. Besides, the number one person... Uh, to buy into the process is because they want to avoid pain, or the number one reason people buy into it is to avoid pain, and they believe things are supposed to get less painful over time. But as champion cyclist Greg Lamont said, it doesn't get any easier, you just go faster. You can't build greatness if your primary feedback loop is built around pain avoidance. In reality, there is no process, and it will be painful. Are you winning? Do more of that. Are you losing? Don't do that. You'll figure out the rest, but in this piece, I explain in detail some helpful things I picked up during my career to figure it out faster. I'll leave this article in the chat. I think it's a hell of a read if you're a uh, Pounder shareholder just to get an understanding of how the CTO, this is one of the most important people in this company that you're invested in, thinks about the concept of winning. And really, you need a rock star CTO CEO to lead that culture to be able to deliver business results at the end of the day for shareholders. So one part of the article that I wanted to highlight, we're not going to read the entire thing, but this is the part of the article that I thought was the most important that gets the, the heart of what Sham is saying. From the article, shortly after Pounder started, investors and the few folks in the Valley who were into us want to hire a well-known 1000X engineer. At this stage as a company, we had nothing, no product, no business, no traction. We were desperate for any validation our model would work. And the fact that this engineer and God would work at Pounder was very validating. The problem was he wanted 500,000 in cash, which amounts to $10 million currently uh, if in from 2004, if that was a 2024 salary, and very clearly didn't value the equity we were offering him. Fundamentally, which is you know the stock-based compensation, fundamentally, he was a mercenary. To him, Pounder wasn't calling. It wasn't a calling. Not giving him the offer was so hard. Our investors weren't happy and our own self of self, sense of self wobbled. But it led us to double down on the importance of missionaries, not mercenaries. From that point forward, all salaries were capped below market, but with generous equity, we were going to be a cult. It was going to be painful to join, so applicants needed to want to be on board badly. Okay. Why did I want to highlight that part from the article? When I was reading this this morning, I was I was very happy to be a Palantir investor. There's not many times you get to invest in a company where the culture of the company is to be so mission focused that the very nature of compensation reflects that missionary versus mercenary focus. Palantir stock stock based compensation 
I will agree it was absurd back in 2020 at about 70% of revenues. But it goes to show you now it's at 22% of revenues. It has dramatically decreased and come in line with other SaaS companies. In fact, other SaaS companies like you know, Snowflake have more excessive stock-based compensation than Palantir. It goes to show you why was it so excessive as they were DPOing. And the reason it was so excessive is because for the 20 years before they DPO'd uh, that, that people chose to work at the company, they chose to be part of a mission. And I, I, I genuinely believe this matters when it comes to an investment thesis. Like the reason people joined and they worked their ass off for 15, 20 years without really getting paid what they could have been paid at Amazon, Meta, Google. By the, time, by the way, that was the 2010 fang era. That's when all these companies were giving out, you know, very lucrative cash-based offers because those companies were in their infancy as they were starting to scale. If you join Palantir, you not only had the opportunity cost of not getting that cash, from uh, a Google or a Microsoft, but you had to now buy into the mission of assuming, right? Like this is an assumption that the equity that they're giving you, the stock-based comp would be worth something one day. And obviously that ended up being okay for people that uh, joined at the company in those early days. Stock, I think at one point it got to $45 in January, 2021, right? DPO at 10, 11 bucks. A lot of people had their shares at one or $2. So it was a really good return over the course of the five, 10 years they worked there. But the point is, those people only got those returns because they decided to work for a company and be a missionary, not a mercenary. Now, what does this mean in the context of investors? If you are investing in a company, I, I, I personally believe you got to be investing because the people that are working at the company at the end of the day, were investing in people, not just management, but from the, you know, junior level engineer to the CTO, they all have to be aligned on the idea that if the company advances and if the company succeeds, everyone wins, investors win. Um, uh, employees win, C-suites win, institutional investors win. Why? Because the stock goes higher. And the reason the stock goes higher is because the company is executing and the market is willing to reward the company. And then people are able to have liquidity uh, to be rewarded in, in cash for what they've been able to do because the stock goes higher. So to me, if you're joining Palantir, and I've you know, talked to Palantir engineers who have gone through eight, nine different interviews just to be able to get into the company, it really does mean you have to believe in the mission. What is the mission? It ranges from technology first, it ranges from a culture of winning. It ranges from Western values and like the, the need and the, the necessity to defend those values. And not all employees always agree with that. And sometimes employees leave because they can't handle that mission. But the point is Palantir's unwavering on making their mission real. And the reason I'm harping on this is because I have seen companies, I think all of us have seen companies, where people are working there for an obvious cash grab. Not everyone cares about optimizing ad clicks at Google, right? But people do care about money. And so when you have these companies where there's not really a mission, there's not really a culture where people actually care. Like if you're working at Shopify, you want the engineer working at Shopify to actually care about the small businesses that are using Shopify's platform. Why? Because Shopify to me is democratizing entrepreneurship at a massive scale. And so you want those engineers to feel that mission. You don't want them to just be there because, you know, they need money for a job. Of course, everyone needs money to survive, right? And that's kind of the primary reason you go. But the mission should play a role, a significant role in how you think about the company, how you work at the company, and your stock-based compensation usually reflects that if you're being paid below what an engineer would be paid at a different company. So Sham really highlighting that missionary culture versus mercenary culture, I think is important. I think it speaks to the moat of Pounter. It's the reason Pounter hasn't had to acquire a company since 2016, right? Whereas, you know, companies like Snowflake had to acquire four companies in 2023. It's a reason we don't have a CEO who's leaving like companies like, Snow you know, and I don't hate Snowflake or anything like that, but you see the sort of typical Wall Street corporate stuff happening at some of these other SaaS players. That's not happening at Palantir because there's a genuine mission these mother effers actually care about building a world-class company, a company that's much bigger than it is today. And I think you need the right culture in order to make that happen. So I thought it was a great article by Sham Sanker. Definitely recommend people check it out and uh, really good read on what the culture is at this company. Okay, so let's get to that snowflake uh, news that I thought this was really, really, really interesting. Uh, last week, Arnie posted this snippet of the Databricks CEO talking about snowflake. It's a minute long clip and I, wanna, I want you guys to hear what he what he had to say. So let's go to that right here. Doing this LLM to make Databricks more competitive, I'm assuming principally against Snowflake. This is the first time you and I have had a chance to talk since Frank Slootman stepped back, stepped down, and they, they brought in a more product-focused leader, is my read. What's your reaction to all of that? What do you make of it? Yeah, I mean, I think we put a lot of pressure on them, and you know, they realized that 
AI is important. So Snowflake basically was not doing any AI whatsoever. They're actually a great company. I have a lot of respect for them. A lot of respect for Frank, actually, who I think did an excellent job with that company. Uh, but they're primarily a data warehousing company. Data warehousing is super important technology, but it's used to ask questions about the past. You know, how did this product do last week? It's not in, predictive. Yeah, it's not predictive. So, and we've been doing, you know, AI for the last decade. So I think it shows that, you know, the puck is going towards AI. I mean, we see that with these generative AI models, with DBRX, with what everybody, you know, every CEO I talk to now, Fortune 500 company will tell me, AI is super critical for our strategy. We think that actually in our whole industry, data and AI is how we're going to become competitive. Help me do that. So, of course, it makes sense that a lot of vendors out there are kind of pivoting now and going towards AI. Now, I thought this was really interesting because the kind of core argument that the Databricks CEO, Databricks is a phenomenal company, uh, was pointing to was that Snowflake is a warehousing technology that was good to ask questions about the past when it comes to interpreting data, but predictive simulations of what data will look like or the business intelligence you can derive from data in the current day in order to make decisions for the future. That's more so in the lane of something like a Databricks, and my argument would be something like Palantir as well. Now, Snowflake is trying to kind of change that, right? They did four acquisitions last year. They Frank Slootman's gone. They have a new uh, CEO who's been saying AI a lot in terms of his folks around AI. So I believe Snowflake is, they had this NVIDIA partnership in May. We haven't really heard much since then that last year. But like the whole idea is they're trying to become an AI oriented platform for your data that doesn't just, that doesn't just store the data, which, you know, at the end of the day, that can become commoditized. Snowflake just has such amazing distribution, but they want to use that distribution to allow a better understanding from an analytical perspective of your data. It was very interesting seeing the Databricks CEO basically say, these guys don't know what they're doing when it comes to AI. And he's not trying to say it, I think, in a mean way. He's kind of just saying, like, this was what the company was built for. That's not what's happening. Great company, a lot of customers, growing revenue, but it's not really AI. I think Palantir is more in the Databricks camp. We've seen a lot of comparisons between Palantir and Databricks. And if Databricks was a public company, I think we would be comparing them a lot more aggressively. Databricks was last valued at $43 billion on the private markets uh, back in 2021. I believe they're growing 50% year over year, uh, maybe the same revenue of, as Palantir. So I would imagine they would Palantir, what, at 55 billion right now? I would imagine Databricks gets a similar type of multiple if they were in the public markets right now. I don't think they would be, be below that $43 billion market cap. But when you're in the public markets, it's a different world, right? You have to deal with shareholders. Your CEO has to be interesting enough to get people to care. Like you have to release quarterly reports. It's a whole different ball game. Eventually, Databricks will go public. If not this year, then I would assume by 2025. And that's, I think, going to be the actual comparison. Databricks versus Palantir. They're in a much more similar lane versus Snowflake and Palantir. So far, Snowflake really, the market not getting ready to accept that they are on, are on a trajectory of growth and the CEO leaving wasn't really the best thing for the stock. So we'll see what happens and what Snowflake does in the context of AI. I don't think they're going anywhere. Uh, I don't think they're going away when it comes to trying to implement AI. I'm pretty sure they have something up their sleeve to really try to take over that sector. But Palantir, Snowflake, and Databricks over the next decade is going to be really interesting to see how that story actually plays out. Okay, last quick couple of updates that I wanted to share with everybody. So we have two things that I wanted to point out. Um, number one is the short float on Palantir. And then number two was the uh, boot camps that Palantir has, which are starting to expand across the entire world. So today, let me pull up this. Let's do short float, short float first, then we'll do boot camps. So short float. This came out literally 30 minutes ago right now. Short float update, Palantir, as of March 28th, um, short float was 4.4%. 82 million shares. It's down 0.43% over the past two weeks. Uh, last two weeks, it was down another 2%. So we are seeing now the 2 billion shares outstanding, 2.18 billion, only 4.4% of those shares are sold short same thesis i've had over the past weeks as we saw that short float come down pretty aggressively from eight percent back in september 2023 now to 4.4 percent people don't want to mess with palantir they're scared of palantir the shorts i think uh carp scared them away with his cocaine comments and at this point they're just like you know what you never know what type of government deal these guys announce or what thing they're on we're just not going to mess with these guys we'll go mess with another company so palantir short float uh has decreased Another big update that I thought was really interesting in, interesting today, Lord Hairgroom, great account on Twitter. Put them in the description. Make sure you follow them as well. Um, they found on LinkedIn the first Palantir AIP bootcamp is coming to Italy. Tomorrow, April 10th, so literally tomorrow. Some, If you guys are watching this on April 10th, you're seeing it on the day of. Uh, PwC Tower, PwC, a consulting firm that has a good relationship with Palantir in Milan. I've never been to Milan. Let me know in the comments if you're from Italy or if you're from uh, Milan. I've never been to Milan. I'm assuming it's a beautiful, beautiful city and uh, amazing 
uh, Alfredo pasta, which is my favorite meal. I've never had it in Italy. I want to have it one day. PwC and Pouncer's team will be together to spread the potential of AI during a day of amazing knowledge sharing and breakout sessions. Come to discover the potential of AI for your business. Get inspired by PwC and Pouncer's vision to take the chance to co-develop a tangible use case alongside PwC and Pouncer engineers and experts. Bull freaking ish. Why is that bullish? Because we're expanding. Boot camps are starting to rack up. If we're going to Italy, who knows how many clients are going to be in that boot camp? Who knows what the percentage is that we convert on those? To me, this is kind of this is the first boot camp. Get it done. Get people assimilated to understand what's going on. PwC and Pounder kind of create that working relationship in Italy so that they're able to get one in the books and then do the next thousand over the coming years. Like this is what you want to see. We saw them go to Zurich in April uh, or in March. We saw them go to London in April. That was for boot camps around insurance. Now boot camp in Italy. We saw them go to India in December. The boot camp model, which is one of the most innovative go-to-market strategies I've seen when it comes to software sales, seems to be happening internationally. And if that happens in the way that we think it can happen, AIP is going to scale rapidly. Customer count is going to scale rapidly. Revenue is going to grow rapidly. Now, will that happen in Q1? Probably not. It'll take a few quarters, if not, you know, by till the midway point of 2025. But I do think that NVIDIA customer count quarter is going to come for us one day uh, as long as these boot camps keep expanding and it's going to take some time to get there. But we are seeing the right signs when it comes to Pounders AIP boot camps starting to scale. All right, that's it for me. Thank you, everybody, for listening and watching. I will see you guys tomorrow, dailypounder.substack.com if you're not subscribed to the free Pounder newsletter every single day. And we'll be back tomorrow on another episode of Daily Pounder. Bye, everybody.